just before anybody thinks I'm going to run out the door and join Sinn Féin, uh, I thought that maybe the best thing I could do for the Irish electorate is give them a wide berth and stick with journalism. But uh, I was just going to make one quick point about the book. I co-authored it with um, my uh, partner, Martina Devlin, and we were always rowing about who could take the uh, majority of the credit for it. And then I said, well, why don't we both take the majority of the credit for it? And my brother, who's a chartered accountant, pointed out, you know, look, mathematically, that's not quite possible, really, if you're both to take a major the majority of the credit for writing the book. But I pointed out to him, it was a book about the Irish banks, so we said, okay, you'll probably get away with that. So that's in terms of where all the work went in the book. But I was just going to make, a, I guess, a broad few points about what I saw as a journalist in terms of what was happening with the banks and the banking crisis as we were covering it. And I think the we told you so bandwagon is getting pretty crowded at the moment with economists, with the IMF and with some opposition politicians. And some people have, as was pointed out here earlier today, have engaged in revisionism. John Hurley from the Central Bank said in March of this year that he warned time and again that house prices were increasing too quickly and too strongly. And it is true the Central Bank did issue that alert, but the bank's main thesis was that Ireland was heading for a soft landing. And I think we'd all agree, we're not really sure if we've landed yet or not, but certainly it hasn't been soft. But the blame game is going on at the moment. It's going to go on for a little bit more to come because what people say in public and what people say in private are two different things. And certainly writing the book, that's something I came up across an awful lot. The politicians are really blaming the banks and the regulators. The banks are largely blaming the regulators. And then some people in regulation say there wasn't the political will to call a halt to the credit and property party and even some mild measures which were proposed by the financial regulator to slow down the banks extending credit for the purchase of greenfield sites were actually watered down following lobbying from some of the banks. And if I've left anyone out, of course, it's the developers. And this time last year, if you asked any business journalists or any of the experts, what was going to happen, they would say, well, look, I think maybe some of the developers are going to go bust. But in reality, what we've seen is effectively the banks would have gone bust were it not for the support of the state. And the big developers are still all out there. And obviously, the thing that seems to be changing at the moment perhaps relates to Liam Carroll, who on Friday was forced to seek protection from the banks, from creditors, as a result of um, pressure from Dutch-owned ACC Bank. Uh, interesting to see the Irish banks are still trying to work with NAMA and we'll see how that's going to pan out in future. But there was one peculiarity about the banking crisis covering it as a journalist and that was that the rest of the world seemed to recognise there was simply, something deeply wrong with the Irish banks long before the Irish authorities really woke up to it. And that might sound like a gross generalisation but the international investors began to sell off the shares in the Irish banks a full 14 months before the Irish banking guarantee. Now, the share slide began in August 2007, so almost two years ago. And the explanation given by those big international investors who were busily selling off shares in the Irish banks was very simple. They said, we're worried about the Irish bank's exposure to commercial property. Now, that was one full month before the collapse of Northern Rock, which sparked the biggest run on a bank in this part of the world for 160 years. Now, in September 2007, the banks still continued to insist they were in fine fettle. There were no sell recommendations by the Irish stockbrokers on Irish bank shares. But by January 2008, the London operation of the Swiss bank, UBS, which I think you heard about earlier on from Dermot Leeson, the UBS analyst, Ross Kern, said there was a danger that commercial property values in Ireland could fall by 30%. And he said that would represent a significant risk to earnings over the next two years for the Irish banks. And he went out and he did something that nobody had done up till then. He told investors to sell your shares in AIB and sell your shares in Anglo. Now, at that time, the Irish-based stockbrokers were still saying there doesn't seem to be a major issue, and none of them publicly issued 
any recommendation for people to sell shares in the Irish banks. They may have done so privately, but there were no public sell recommendations. And indeed, when this was put to them that, look, the Irish brokers have a different view on things to people across the water, they, some of them said, look, we think that they're really engaged in paddy bashing and nothing more. But if we went forward for six months into July 2008, Richie Boucher, who at the time was head of retail at uh, banking at Bank of Ireland, appeared before an Oireachtas committee. And he assured politicians in terms that could not be misconstrued. He said, if bad debts and the economy get worse, we believe we are sufficiently capitalized. And he went on and he said, we believe we have enough capital to meet the bad debts of a significantly greater magnitude than we believe them to be. And we are very often wrong, but we have a strong belief that we have significant and sufficient capital to meet even the worst case scenarios that we envisage. Now, it's worth bearing in mind, Richie Boucher is now chief executive of Bank of Ireland. But at the time, he wasn't the only optimist. Indeed, most of the other banks were making similar noises. But the market was still telling us something different. The shares were still sliding. The international investors were still selling us something different. The bond market was telling us something different. It was the same message that they'd been sending at that stage for a full 12 months. And the regulator, whatever about the concerns about what regulators were doing in other countries, the regulator here didn't seem to be paying as much attention to what the international investors were saying. The chief executive of the regulator's office, Patrick Neary, appeared in prime time in September 2008. And his interview was an attempt to reassure the public there was no run on the Irish banks. And in that interview, he fostered the impression that the banking system was actually in good shape. And after his interview, Fine Gael's finance spokesman, Richard Bruton, said he found it astonishing that Patrick Neary said that the risky lending of the banks and the property market collapse had nothing to do with the current crisis. And Mr. Bruton pointed out that Mr. Neary's insistence that liquidity was the only issue rather than the bad lending and levels of capitalization suggests the regulator thinks we're largely dealing with a business as usual situation. Now, 11 days after that interview, which Patrick Neary gave, reassuring everyone that everything was okay, we did take the step of introducing the state guarantee for all the banks. People talk a lot about the collapse of Lehman Brothers, which is an institution which goes back before the Irish famine. And it obviously did enormous damage when it folded on September the 15th last year. We know a lot about that. And in effect, the event loosened a cornerstone and the whole financial edifice was no longer structurally sound. But you might ask yourself why, because banks have gone bust and closed before. But the simple reason uh, for people outside the financial community who wonder about this a lot, is that the money which was lent to Lehman's, those bonds were worth nothing as soon as Lehman's closed for business. And all of a sudden, as soon as Lehman's collapsed, lending to banks became a very risky proposition. Within two weeks of its collapse, the Irish banks were brought to their knees. On the evening of September the 29th, which was the big night, and we knew something big was going to have to happen after that night, that was the night when at the end of business, Anglo's shares had fallen 46%, Bank of Ireland 17%, Irish Life and Permanent had lost a third of its value, and AIB was down 15%. There was a share rally the following morning after the government did introduce the guarantee, and it did go some way to alleviate the uh, liquidity issue. But the banks still seem to be living in something of a state of denial about their need for new capital. On October the 23rd, 2008, Eugene Sheehy, the chief executive of AIB, said he would rather die than introduce new capital. Introducing new capital meant diluting the existing shareholders, obviously. On November the 20th, 2008, the chief executives and the chairpersons were brought into Farmley, and they met Brian Lenehan there. And by this stage, the value of Irish shares had collapsed from 55 billion euro 18 months earlier to just 4 billion euro. So we're in complete wipeout territory. But many of the banks at those meetings were still trying to insist that they didn't see any need for introducing new capital. Now, by this time across the water, Britain had adopted a completely different strategy, a much faster strategy. Gordon Brown had seized the moment, and he provided a 37 billion pound bailout shared by Royal Bank of Scotland, which owns Ulster Bank.
uh, which provided loans to people like Sean Dunn. You may remember the Jewry site in Bowles Bridge. That's going to be um, the British government's problem, or so the Irish help, hope anyway. Uh, and obviously that, that guarantee and the um, bailout which Gordon Brown uh, provided also covered Lloyd's TSB, which is taking over Halifax Bank of Scotland, which has a, a, a large-ish operation here, which has expanded. But we know what happened here afterwards, the bailouts and the uh, uh, recapitalizations of AIB and Bank of Ireland, 3.5 billion euro for each, and a 3 billion euro recapitalization of Anglo, its nationalization and potential for a similar um, recapitalization again of Anglo. But much of the damage that's been done to Ireland as a place to do business has been as a result of the multiple scandals at Anglo-Irish Bank. And I, I see Alan Jukes sitting there in the audience who's a, a director of Anglo. And I think many of you will be very interested to hear what he has to say uh, when I think he's speaking tomorrow. But I just wanted to um, uh, refer to Paul Krugman. He's been referred to a lot uh, um, over the, the day. And uh, I was away last week and I brought away his book, which has the uh, very uplifting title, The Return of Depression Economics. I was reading it on my holiday and my girlfriend was wondering what was going on, but anyway. Um, but in it he makes just a point about uh, banks, and I just want to read out the paragraph he wrote. He says that carelessness offers a tempting opportunity to unscrupulous businessmen. Just open a bank, make sure it has an impressive building and a fancy name, attract a lot of deposits by paying good interest, if that isn't allowed, by offering toasters or whatever, then lend out money at high interest rates to high rolling speculators, preferably your friends, or maybe even yourself, behind a different corporate fund. The depositors won't ask about the quality of your investments, since they know they are protected in any case. And you now have a one-way option. If the investments do well, you become rich. If they do badly, you can simply walk away and let the government clean up the mess. Now, he was just making that as a broad point about banking and some of the pitfalls. But uh, so much of what happened in Anglo isn't new. It's just actually new to us. And this could ex be explained why people are so bewildered by the speed and the slump and its severity. But there are two questions repeatedly put to people who are involved in this area. The first one is, where did all the money go? And the second one is, Will people go to jail? And in terms of the first one, the answer isn't too difficult uh, because the money wasn't there in the first place. Uh, the second one is a little bit more tricky. We simply don't know. But I just wanted to give you a very brief overview of the various parts of the Anglo affair that are under investigation and who's looking at it and what the potential penalties are. First is Anglo's secret loans to directors which were warehoused by Irish Nationwide quick point on Irish Nationwide because Frederick was looking for some good news. Uh, the good news was one of the Icelandic banks was trying to take over Irish Nationwide and couldn't do the deal. So that's some good news for Iceland. Um, uh, but any, anyway, so they warehoused these, uh, these uh, directors' loans, primarily the 106 million euro lent to the uh, former chairman, Sean Fitzpatrick. Those loans are being examined by the financial regulator, the stock exchange, and the corporate enforcer, Paul Lappleby. Next is the Golden Circle. Now, these were the investors who were lent money to buy Anglo shares uh, from Sean Quinn, but that lending came from Anglo, and that's the very tricky point. And the potential loss, as outlined in Anglo's annual report, the potential loss to Anglo is 300 million euro or so as a result of that. And obviously, the taxpayer effectively now owns Anglo, so that's the concern there. So that's being investigated by the Gardaí and Paul Appleby, and the investigation will also examine the role of Anglo and its advisors who set up the scheme. Next is the back-to-back -back deposits involving Anglo and Irish permanent, Irish life and permanent, I should say, which totaled 8 billion euro. Now those transactions, uh, the concern about them is that they effectively allowed Anglo present a better set of results than would have been the case. Effectively, those deposits were mi misrepresented uh, to investors and they should not have been stated as they were when Anglo initially set out its results. 
they have been referred to the Gardaí by the financial regulator as well. The Institute of Chartered Accountants is investigating the role of its members, including Ernst & Young, who audited Anglo, the bank's former directors, Sean Fitzpatrick, David Drum, and Willie McTeer, and Irish Life and Permanence uh, former finance director, Peter Fitzpatrick. But the most serious aspect of the multiple investigations relates to the deposits made in conjunction with Irish Life and Permanent and the Golden Circle deal. And the reason they are more serious than anything else is that they involve potential breaches of market abuse regulations which carry penalties of up to 10 million euro and are 10 years in jail. So we don't know what's going to happen there, but certainly um, many people would argue when you look at what's happening in the United States with uh, Bernie Madoff immediately going to jail, at least it shows what happens when you do wrong and when ordinary people are duped and misled. And I think speaking to many people out there, they would like to see that people who do wrong do suffer the punishments that they are due and don't just get off the hook because they have the ability to use very well-practiced lawyers. Anglo was certainly the most risky of the Irish banks. And just to answer that question of how the banking crisis happened, you can just look at its lending. From 2004 to 2008, lending to customers at Anglo almost tripled from 24 billion euro to 72 billion euro. Over the same period, lending at AIB nearly doubled from 76 billion to 129 billion. Now, the scale of this expansion was unnerving, particularly as it coincided with the later stages of a boom. But lending with all banks increased dramatically. And that was, I was just talking about the figures regarding general lending. But the key issue about all of this is the lending to property developers. And I know that um, Dermot Leeson was speaking here earlier, and he did say that banks had made lending and had made big mistakes in their lending. And he was certainly right, because if you look at the list in terms of lending to property developers, at the top is AIB. And it lent 22 billion euro to property developers. Next, Anglo, 17 billion euro. Next comes Bank of Ireland at 13 billion euro. So if you just stop there and think about that for a moment. The two biggies, AIB and Bank of Ireland, the lending in two property developers at AIB was very large when compared to Bank of Ireland. AIB, 22 billion. Bank of Ireland, 13 billion. A big difference there. Next was Irish Nationwide, which lent 8 billion euro to property developers. Now, that accounted for 80% of its lending. It's worth bearing in mind it was supposed to be a building society. Therefore, it was supposed to be lending to people to buy homes, lending ordinary mortgages. But 80% of its activity was to large-scale property development. Uh, and then EBS had a much smaller amount to property developers of 500 million euro. Um, in total, those loans to developers came to 80 billion, sorry, 60 billion euro. And we know the National, Mas National Asset Management Agency, or NAMA, is going to take on those loans as well as the land loans. Now, the land loans, effectively, what they're talking about there is stuff that's already built. In other words, it's not in development, like a shopping center which has a loan attached to it. And that's, all of that accounts to 90 billion. That's what the total value of those loans was. The government is going to be buying that back via NAMA. And um, we don't really know how much they're going to pay. They're going to have to go through all the loans, but that's the key issue. Potentially the figure, one figure that's out there, is Ireland may have to buy back those loans at a cost of 50 billion euro. But the next question is, what exactly is going to happen to Anglo? The government has ruled out an orderly wind down of the bank. Uh, so far, to the best of my knowledge, there's no published business plan for the bank, um, no chief executive appointed, and potentially half of the bank's loans could go into NAMA. We know the size of the balance sheet is going to be shrunk, and the gov government does seem to be open to offers to those willing to purchase part of its loan book. So while the Minister for Finance may rule out a wind down, what's going to be left is going to be an awful lot smaller than what was there before. But what about the other banks then? It certainly seems as if there's going to be consolidation. And when I say consolidation, I mean mergers. 
and there would really have to be. And when we have mergers, that generally does mean job losses. And speaking to the people in the banking sector, they say potentially we're looking at 10,000 job losses over the next few years within the Irish banking sector. Uh, and that's obviously going to be very painful, and they're also going to be quite good jobs. They're going to be reasonably well-paid jobs for qualified people. And many of those people were following orders from on high, and many of them feel very badly about what's happened, and many of them are really quite innocent. Others aren't, but a lot of the people who lose their jobs didn't do anything wrong. It seems as if Bank of Ireland will end up being about 25% owned by the state. Uh, AIB is in a different position. The shareholding by the state could end up being significantly larger, perhaps a majority shareholding. Then permanent TSB, there's a possibility that it might be separated out of Irish life and permanent, and it could form part of a third banking force with the merged EBS and Irish nationwide. Now, the IMF puts the losses at the Irish banks over the coming years at 35 billion euro. The Irish banks have some capital to absorb that, but not all by a long stretch. So in reality, what's going to happen is that the Irish taxpayer is going to be paying for many years to come in one way or another to sort the mess out. And maybe we've learned our lesson from what happened, but history repeats itself for those who weren't watching the first time. And there's a frequently misquoted paragraph from Karl Marx in Das Kapital. And he says, in every stock jobbing, our stockbroking swindle, everyone knows that in some time or other the crash must come. But everyone hopes that it might fall on the head of their neighbour after he himself has caught the shower of gold and placed it in safety. Après moi, le déluge is the watchword of every capitalist and every capitalist nation. Hence, capital is reckless for the health or length of life of the labourer. That was Karl Marx. But as we know, none of the Marxists ever made it into the boardrooms of the Irish banks. Thanks very much.